alternative energy solutions. So they think that some of these can generate different types of fuels, and, and they're trying to sequence and find the proteins that can do that. So this, the, this is the ability that we now have that wasn't there maybe five years ago. We can level, as I said, we can measure the levels of mRNA. We can measure structures of protein. We can measure which protein interact with each other. Which, with each other. We can look at this back uh, feedback loop that tells us which proteins control which other proteins and so forth. And all, all of this can be done using high throughput methods. Basically, they give you a lot of information together. And now the question is, what do we do with this information? How can we put it together so that we really understand what's going on inside the cell? So each, each of these types of data sets gives us a specific view of the activity inside our body. And the challenge computationally also biologically is to put this together and understand, for example, how does cancer progress, right? We start with a sequence. There are some mutations that lead to some proteins being misgenerated. And these interact with other proteins that in turn affect the generation of others, and, and cancer is one outcome of this. So if we can put all of this information about what is the sequence, what are the levels of the proteins, which proteins interact with each other, which proteins control, which other proteins are going to be generated, try to put it together, we may get a model of how things go wrong, for example, in cancer. So this is the main focus of, of the work in computational biology over the last, I would say, decade. Because, again, because we could, collect, we, we could have collected other types of data over the, uh, for many decades, right? We can observe people. We can do post-mortem, uh, I, I don't know, take some organs and look at them under the microscope. But it was very hard to collect the cellular data over these years. But I don't want you to get the impression that computational biology is only about uh, what's happened inside our body. So can anybody tell me what is the most important sporting event that happened this week. Important, I mean, in terms, for example, of the number of spectators that actually watched it. Yes? Uh, right. So clearly, the Boston Marathon is the most important uh, sporting event, right, uh, of this week. Um, a lot of people heard that Jerry Jones wanted to break the record for the number of spectators in the Super Bowl, and he was trying to pack 108,000 people into Dallas Stadium, but he didn't succeed. Um, Boston Marathon has been watched live by more than 500,000 people. Uh, so it's definitely um, a very important event. Another thing that happened in the Boston Marathon this year is that um, the runner that won the Boston Marathon did it in an incredible time. They actually did it a, a minute faster than the best time recorded for marathons ever. So basically, they run it in 203, which is something like 4 minutes and 45 seconds per mile for 26 miles. Most people here, if not everybody, cannot run one lap of the CMU track in the time they ran 106 laps, 104 laps. So this is incredible. Um, and, and, and breaking the, the, the record by one minute is also unheard of. Now, if you talk to sport analysts, they actually credit this with uh, the structure of the Boston course. So Boston, unlike almost any other marathon, including the Pittsburgh Marathon, which is going to be in three weeks, is not a point to point. So you don't start and end at the same point. You take the buses 26 miles, and then you run back. And as it happened, uh, sometimes this helps you because in this year, for example, they claim that there was a very strong tailwind the entire way. You can't have it in Pittsburgh because you run in a circle, but in Boston you had a 15 miles tailwind. Someone pushed you for 15 miles per hour, and you can think that that definitely helped. But what the analyst ignored is the fact that it's really a, a function of computational biology. So last year, uh, there was this paper published in PLOS Computational Biology, one of the leading computational biology journals, which analyzed the metabolic intake required to marathon runners and gave you some formula about how much you, want, you need to eat. I don't know how many of you watch the Tour de France, but when you see them crest these mountains, they usually go to the back and they take something and eat it and then go down. In marathon, you also uh, can eat during the marathon or drink. And this paper analyzed computationally what is the caloric intake that you need and what is the best efficient way. And obviously, they read it and took it into account and was able to 
improve. No, but, but at least this is definitely one direction that computational biology can go, even though it's not uh, necessarily molecular. So this looks at metabolic uh, uh, intake, which is basically organ or even body-based. So there are things you can do in other levels of computational biology. Um, another example is clinical application of computational biology. So here is an example of a, a clinical test that is being used right now. And that test basically measures the levels of genes in a tumor. So basically we have, um, if you have a breast cancer and it's recurring, there are a few things you can do, um, a few alternative treatment options. And using this test, it actually tells you what option is best for you. So you can do different things or you can take different drugs. The test basically tells you which one you should do. Before that, before this test existed, people would just try one of them and if it didn't work, we'd have to switch six, weeks, six months later. The problem is, of course, that first of all, you waste six months, and sometimes this is, you know, lethal. In, in, I mean, if you didn't take the right treatment, and also you, had, you can have side effects of the treatment, even if it doesn't, I mean, the treatment doesn't help you, it can actually harm you. So this type of tests are very important. And you can see, I mean, this is the Washington Post report, but the idea is instead of, there are tests before, there are some existing tests that look at uh, something called biomarkers, but they usually look at one protein at a time. This is the first test to look at a lot of proteins at once, in this case 70 proteins. And Washington Post really says that this is a formula, but in reality, they're using a classifier, basically. And it's proprietary, we don't know which classifier they're using, but it's probably a variant of support vector machine, uh, based on some early papers they published. And, and you take this, you measure the levels of proteins in your cell, you have 70 different values that you take into account, and based on some classification that was trained on a lot of different individuals, you make a prediction, and, and based on the prediction, basically, people decide which drug to take. So this is something that came out of computational biology, of course, applied to clinical applications. Um, this is some work that we did where we took uh, hidden Markov models and used them to combine a static and time series data to model some systems in the cell. Um, so data integration is a key issue in computational biology. We have a lot of these types of information. Some of them are static, some of them are temporal. How do we put them together? Uh, another example or another area of, comp of machine learning that is being used is active learning. Um, I don't know if you had time to cover active learning, but this is a process in which instead of working with training example, you actually actively seek the different training examples. And a few years ago, and this has been extended since, um, researchers in the UK developed what they call the robot scientist. And the idea is that the robot scientist can actually um, not only perform the experiments, but also design the experiments. So basically it would go to uh, whatever the bench, or it would go to some close it, take out the samples, run the experiments, analyze the results, and decide which experiments to do next. And the way it would do it is by using active learning methods. So basically, trying to determine what experiments to do in order to get the best outcome, or to minimize the number of experiments so that you get the best model for your output. So this, again, this is something that was uh, done uh, with machine learning in mind. Okay, so, the, so machine learning covers a lot of different uh, aspects of this. I would like to focus today on a specific problem that people have been facing in computational biology over now at least two decades, and how um, using ideas for machine learning really changed, I think, the way people uh, address this or try to solve this problem. And the problem that um, I'm going to focus on is how to deal with sequence data. So sequence data, as I said, is something that is very common in, in biology, uh, right? Everything basically is derived from sequence. Uh, of course, there are, or oh, nowadays we know that sequence doesn't dictate everything. There are things beyond sequence. But sequence definitely uh, plays an important role. A lot of diseases are associated with changes in sequence. So... Uh, Anybody knows how long the DNA is uh, of individuals? I mean, every, we, have, we have trillions of cells inside our body, right? 50 trillions. Each of these has a copy of the DNA, which is a big book, which has a number of different letters. Anybody knows how many letters? 
Although, yes? What? No, no, not the right total number of letters in the DNA. Anybody that is not maybe a computational biology major? <laughs> Give a guess. Not the four letters, right? I mean, the, I mean, how many? What's the size? What's the length of the DNA? If we look at the, everybody heard about the DNA, right? I mean, it's well, all the what? Less than six billion base pairs, isn't it? Less than six billion, yeah. Yeah, but there's a lot of numbers below six. So what? <laughs> <laughs> it's like in like two, three, four, five, or six billion. Right, right. So billions is the right range. Um, it's basically three. Three billion letters, um, which is very large. Um, anybody try to copy three billion letters? Uh, ever? Um, so. Our body does it all the time, right? I mean, cells are generated all the time, and they are generated by copying the DNA of another cell and, and producing a new cell, basically splitting into two. So, so the sequence in our body, of course, if you think about it, when you, if you would try to copy three billion letters, you would make some mistakes, um, and the cells also make some mistakes. There is a very elaborate error correction mechanism employed in each of our cells, but even that is not enough. So some mistakes do happen, and then what happens is sometimes, or most of the times, these mistakes don't make any difference. But in some cases, the mistakes are problematic. And if enough mistakes accumulate, we can get cancer, for example. So the, w the way we can find that out is if we know how to read these uh, things, we can look at the sequence and try to see what are the mistakes that, uh, that we have there, what is their function, and, and, and what, what, what basically went wrong. So analyzing sequence is very important for uh, diseases, but it's also important just to understand what our sequence is. So sequence analysis has been for decades one of the major uh, issues in computational biology. Um, there are roughly 25,000 different proteins, or 25,000 genes that can give rise to 25,000 different proteins in our body. And one major question is, what is the function? What do they do, right? A lot of these proteins are involved in very important processes. We want to know what does each of these proteins do, does, for basic understanding, but also for practical reasons. Okay, so how can we find out what, what do these proteins do? There are a number of ways to do it. Some ways are direct experiment. So, for example, we can remove a protein uh, by something called a knockdown. We usually don't do it on individuals but we can do it on, 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 on some lab cell, something called the cell line or some cells that are growing in, in, on a petri, petri dish. Nowadays, you can actually design some probes that will bind to, the, uh, to, that, will bind to that and, and knock it down, and then you do this direct experiment. It's possible, but it's a very lengthy proce process, and even that requires a lot of hypothesis before you start doing it. Uh, you can look at partners, uh, like in social networks, if you want to know is something about uh, individual, if you know it's social, it's, it's social network, it tells you immediately, right? If, if you see that someone is interacting with a lot of sophomores, it might tell you that this guy is a sophomore or a junior at CMU, for example, right? So similarly in proteins, if we know a lot of other proteins and we see that this guy interacts with a lot of other proteins, it tells us something about the protein. Uh, we can look at the structure. Proteins are th machines, basically. And if we know how they, the 3D structure, we can tell something about the function, but it's actually very hard to do. So all of these experiments are very hard to do, but there's one thing that is pretty easy to do, and that's look at sequence homology. It turns out that a lot of proteins are very similar to other proteins that do the same task, because sequence usually implies structure, or it has some relationship to the structure of the protein, and if two proteins share very large parts of the sequence, then they are going to share structure, which in turn means that they will share function. Now, let's say I'm giving you a database of a lot of proteins that I know what they do. It doesn't have to be necessarily in human. It can be in other species. So, for example, a lot of people work on mice. A lot of the drug discovery is done on mice. Or even simpler organisms. Flies, for example, have been a very a popular a lab animal. Um, below that, worms. Specific type of worms are very uh, popular. And even below that, yeast, which is used to make bread, and more importantly, beer, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a, a, a model organism that um, is, is being employed a lot. And it turns out that across all of these species, there's very large similarity 
between some of the proteins in this species and humans. And if you know something about the proteins in yeast, for example, it can tell you what the similar protein in human does, because these things are highly conserved, at least in some cases, across all of these species. So if we have a query gene, and we have a database of genes that we know what they do in other species, we can, um, right, we can try and search the database for genes that are very similar, and then if we find them, it tells us something about the genes that are, we are interested in. Now, if it doesn't completely resolve it, at least it gives us a good hypothesis, and then we can do a specific test about, on that. But at least it resolves the complete ambiguity that we had when we just found the gene. Okay, so for example, when I said this guy, Venter, goes to the ocean and fishes out all these organisms, when they sequence them, they can find the genes and then blast or compare them over all the other genes, and then they can see which ones are new on which ones have been worked out of it. So this is a, a, a reasonable strategy, but of course the question is, how do we decide what is similar and what is not? Or how do we compare two different sequences? How do we determine when, when, what, are, what, what is the similarity? And again, this has been a major issue, so we can actually construct these databases. There are actually databases like that. Um, many of them are hosted by the National Institute of Health. In DC. And the question is, given, um, given some sequences, or given a database of sequences and a new query sequence, how do we determine what are the most similar sequences to my sequence of interest? Okay, so this is a computational problem, but it has a lot of practical implications. And initially, this was based primarily on combinatorial methods, on combinatorial matching algorithms. There's still a lot of work on combinatorial matching algorithms, but more recently, even a de starting a decade ago, people have started to move to using machine learning tools um, for a number of reasons, which we'll discuss later. So let's just talk about the general problem, computational problem, and what are the methods that can be used, and then see why machine learning methods may be useful for this. So the idea is that we take a set of inputs, or maybe one specific uh, gene, and we look at this gene across different species. So, for example, there are genes that are involved in copying the DNA. Okay? Copying the DNA is something that is being done in all species. So every time cells divide, the DNA has to be copied. So this is a highly conserved mechanism. A lot of genes, a lot of proteins that are involved in this are the same in yeast, flies, worms, and us basically. Okay, so let's take a gene that we think is the same across all of these species, basically does the same thing involved in this copying mechanism, and put them together. We can see that even though they should do the same thing, and we can see that the letters match pretty well, so by the way, the, the language of the genes is four, four letters, they call nucleotides, so we don't have the 24 letter O. The, the regular alphabets of uh, English or other, other languages, there's only four, and they are A, C, G, and T, okay? So we can take the sequence, we know the sequence of the gene, we put them uh, together, and we see that they are pretty similar. So almost all of them have A in the first row, C in the second row, and A, T, and C in the last row, but we can see some differences, okay? So something in the middle is missing in some of them, and sometimes we have some changes on the right and left, uh, on, on specific letters. Now, it's very important to understand where these changes came from because if we can understand this, we will know how to search for similar things, right? If we, that's go, the, the, the way changes can occur is going to affect how we define similar things, right? If some changes can occur pretty frequently, we would actually allow these changes and still say that it's similar, but if changes are very unlikely to occur, then we would not use or we would, not, we would ignore this if we would look for similar things. Um, for our query gene. So how can changes occur in genes across different species? It turns out there are three main uh, ways that we can have changes. One of them is substitution. So when the DNA is copied, a letter can change to another letter. So for example, T can change to A can change to T, or in this case, C change to G. Now sometimes this substitution, this change is very problematic. But in other times, actually, this change doesn't have any impact. Can anybody tell me in which cases 
change would not have any impact? Or well, anybody knows enough biology to... When genes, but let's say a, a gene is, I mean, this change is now recorded in the species, so it's not one-time thing. This is all the genes in yeast have this G. All the other genes have C, but in, in human, in fly, in worm, but just in yeast, or let's say in worm, it has the G. So maybe it's not used sometimes, but if it's there, it's probably used in some cases. But still, even though it's used, the change doesn't matter. Right. Good. So um, how is error correction, by the way, carried out in cells? That's an interesting question, right? Because error correction is something we care about in computer science. One way error correction is performed is by a mapping from these letters into the language of the proteins. So proteins are actually um, sequences of amino acids, of specific molecules, and there are 20 different amino acids that can be used to form a protein. Each one of them is encoded by a three-letter code from DNA. Because we have four possible values for each letter, there are 64 possible triplets of DNA, and they map to 20 different amino acids. So it's a many-to-one mapping. And in some cases, actually, you can think about it on, on average, every three triplets map to the same amino acid. So some changes are not going to make any difference, okay? Some will, but some are not going to make any difference, at least not in the mapping. They might make differences in other, uh, in other things. Uh, we won't go into that. But, but the difference may not be very important. So there could be a substitution. C, C changes to G, but it's not going to affect the uh, overall output of this. In some cases, it will affect. So substitutions are one case where you can have changes. Another case is something called insertions. And this actually is important. But the copying mechanism they made a mistake and inserted the letter, even though it shouldn't have been there. And another change is deletion. So we can have, even though it should have a letter here, in some species, this was deleted. OK, so these are the three reasons why we may have differences between genes, even if they are very similar. So when we look for similar genes, we need to take this into account and accommodate for these small differences Right? We don't want to say every letter is substitute. Then, you know, two completely different things are completely, I mean, that's not interesting. But we should allow a few substitutions, a few insertions, a few deletions. But the question is, you know, how do we do that? Or what type of computer, or how do we compute how similar these two are? Okay, so for example, if we have these two uh, genes that we want to match, these two sequences, we can match it this way, right? A perf almost a perfect matching. We can, ins we can say that, there is an insertion after the first A, and then insertion after the last T, or we can say that there is a substitution, right? So two places here, or we can say that there is just one substitution here. And this is important because, or it's important to determine which one is the correct one, because if we have to have a, right? The idea is that we take a query sequence, we have a huge database, and we, we run it through, compare it to the database, and then choose the most similar sequence. But the, the question is, how do we define the most similar? And the answer is, let's try to align it and see the alignment that leads to the most uh, likely outcome. But in order to answer what is the most likely outcome, we need to say how likely it is to see an insertion, how likely it is to see a deletion, and how likely it is to see a substitution. OK, so this is the basic, uh, the basic problem. And this is done what we're using a computational method or a computational formula. So here is the uh, model that people usually use to compare different uh, sequences. And what we usually do is we look at log odds uh, score for this alignment. Um, the numerator is the probability that x and y, sorry, this is the, den the denominator, is the probability of seeing these two sequences independently. Basically, if we have two independent uh, sequences, then the probability of seeing A here and B here is just the product of the probability of seeing A and the probability of seeing B. These two are independent, right? Something we learned. So we have a product of all the letters in the first, all the letters in the second, and this is the denominator. The second thing is the numerator. Sorry. And that's the probability of seeing X and Y 
if these two are related. Related means basically that they were initially the same gene and then they diverge using these insertion deletion substitutions. Okay? So for example, if I have A and A, then it's very likely under the, uh, under the related model, um, it's also maybe likely under the independent, but we don't get any benefit from the fact that it's the same. Whereas if I have A and C, it's much like, more likely under the independent model and less likely under the related model, or A and a gap and so forth. But the bottom line is we have a way to score different alignments, okay? And the score is just the sum of the log, so basically a product of these probabilities or the sum in the log space of the ratio of the joint model or the related model over the background model, the independent model. So we have a way to score basically two xi and yi. xi and yi are locations in the alignment. So it could be a gap versus a, it could be aa, or it could be ac in the, in the previous example that I showed. And now what we need to do is design a function. Okay, so we want some alignment that maximizes, or our goal is to find, or to find the best, so we get a query gene, we have a database, and we want to find the best alignment for each gene in the database to our query gene, such that the alignment, the, the, the assignment of pairs that we have maximizes the likelihood ratio uh, compared to some background. Okay, this is fine, the, the idea of trying to, yes? Okay. Right, so, good. So the key issue, I don't know about how that, that model works, but I think the key issue, and, and I wonder how they did it there, the key issue is to define, you can always match, if you add gaps, right? You can match everything to everything. Just put a, if you have a mistake, you just put a gap, right? So the key question usually when people design these things is how likely it is to have a gap and how likely it is to see a substitution. So, for example, it turns out that it's more likely to change A to T, for example, than A to G. So I'm not sure how, I, I guess maybe they're using the same overall idea, but I think the parameters are very important and they might differ, I guess, between uh, them. So, right, I mean, how likely it is, and, and, and to determine these parameters, people usually take, in this, in biology at least, they start, and I guess you might, maybe they do it also in text, I don't know, maybe Tom knows, but, uh, but in general, what they do in biology is they start with a very highly curated set of genes that they think are the same, and then they compute the statistics of how likely it is to see, and then we use that for future. So it's like a training for, to set the parameters, and then we get it uh, for this. So the basic idea is that adding a gap is always possible, right? Whenever I add a gap, I'm going to uh, eliminate any mistake that I have, right? Because if I have an A and a G, I just say, okay, I have an insertion here, a deletion here, good, I'm putting a gap. But of course, gaps are unlikely. Insertions and deletions are not events that you expect to see a lot. They can happen, but they have to be penalized. So the idea is that you try to, um, in, in this case, this negative number, okay? So if we have a, a, an alignment, this is using dynamic programming, you'll see in a second, but if we have some alignment, I'm willing to insert a gap, but I have to pay a penalty. If I don't want to pay the penalty, I have to accept the similarity between these two. If this is A and A, then I'm actually getting a positive value because they are the same. If this is A and C, I'm going to pay a penalty, usually higher than the gap, but then I might not need to add gaps later. Okay, so let me show you an example and see how this works. So, but this is basically a function that you can use to decide whether or not to insert gap. And using this function, we can compute optimal alignments very efficiently using dynamic programming. Okay, so here's, an, here's the idea. The idea is that we start with one sequence, we put it on the x-axis, the other can be on the y-axis, and then we just fill in this alignment matrix. And the alignment matrix basically says, if you are in one location here, and you want to, if you want to get to this location where basically C is aligned to A, you can either come from C aligned to A here and insert a gap in this direction, you can come from here and insert a gap in this direction, or you can come in the diagonal and then insert A and C as a, as a similarity pair. So basically you have three options to get to this location here, 
And each option has a different score, right? You start with the score of this and add the gap, the score of this and add the gap, or the score of this and add the similarity of the two letters, and you decide, like any dynamic program algorithm, which one is the best for you. Let's do an example that will be hopefully clearer. So let's say I'm setting uh, the similarity if A and B are the same, right? I'm saying that you get a plus one, a gap is minus one, and if they are different, then it's minus five. These are not actual values, but it will be enough for our uh, demonstration. Okay, we initialize the table, right, with all gaps. So A minus one because it comes from zero, G minus two, and so forth, all the Y axis and all that. Again, hopefully most of you are familiar with dynamic programming. Oh, everybody should be familiar if you learn the HMMs. And now we start to fill in the uh, columns. It's actually very easy because we just look at the previous um, three uh, uh, entries and decide where we want to go. So if we want to, if we want to go here, we look at these three entries. If we go from zero, we have to match A and A, which means that we are putting one, right? A, the similarity of A and A is one. So we put zero plus one. Um, if we went for minus one and insert a gap, we would have minus two, which is not good, and minus two, which is not good, so this is one. And then we go on like this based on the formula, and we can fill in the next two are zero, because usually it's best to go to one, but then we have to match A and G, or C and A, both, sorry. It's best, so it's best for us to put in, in both cases, a gap, and so forth, and so forth. We can fill this out, this out. Okay, so that's what we get uh, at the end. And this gives us the alignment of these two, the, or the, the best alignment of these two. How do we get the alignment based on this? So we start at the bottom right and we backtrack to the uh, value that basically led us to the next. So for example, three could have come from here, here, and here. Actually, it came from here, so we go here. Or, basically, or actually, what we really do is, during the computation, we actually keep track of where we came from, and then it's easy to trace back. Uh, that. Right, so we actually start with three, and we go back all the way, and this is the align that we get, basically. Okay, so the challenge here, mainly, is to come up with the parameters. If we know the gap parameter and the substitution, that's pretty easy now to compute. There are a few issues, I'm not going to go into that, but people have actually worked quite a lot and still work on this. Um, for example, it turns out that it's much more likely to start, sorry, it's much less likely to start an insertion than to extend it. So you might be willing or you might be paying a higher penalty for introducing a gap, but if you already have a gap, extending it is less costly. So it's more likely. So instead of doing this, you have to keep in, keep in mind what was before you. So you can do that. There's something called local alignment where you don't care about the um, relationship across the entire sequence. You just want to find the subsequence that is the most highly similar. And that's also very useful. Um, and, and there are a number of different variants of this, which people have been playing actually quite a lot with. Um, how long does it take to do this computation? What's the runtime here? <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, right. n times m if you have different size, or if the same size, it's n square, right? Because we need to fill in this table, basically, which is an n square table. That doesn't sound like a huge deal, but... Uh... Okay, so this is the uh, process of sequence alignment, very popular process in computational biology, uh, but very problematic, actually. Uh, n square is pretty good if you do it for two sequences. But if you now generate, um, if you have databases with hundreds of thousands, millions, or tens of millions of sequences of, of genes that have been worked out, or <coughs> tens of hundreds of thousands, right? Trying to run an n square search over each of them is going to take a very long time. Um, local alignment is not going to save you time, so it's still n square. I mean, it gives you, the result may be slightly different, but the, the run time is going to be still the same. Okay, so this is, um, not very good idea, and, and, and people abandoned it very quickly, actually. So I guess in the early 90s, where well, we had relatively few sequences that still worked, but 
even in the mid 90s this has been abandoned um, for a different solution anybody knows what the other solution that people are actually are still using I would say the solution to this problem which is actually not based on machine learning unfortunately uh, is the most popular method in molecular biology so anybody heard about PCR which is like the standard the solution to this is much more used than PCR so I think the tool that biologists use the most is a tool that is a computational tool basically and it was a tool that was developed to solve this problem anybody knows the name of this tool that is not a computational biology uh, anybody anybody wants to guess uh, the name so it's something called BLAST anybody heard about the name BLAST no so BLAST is basically an alignment problem, a program. Um, the idea of BLAST is that it's a heuristic search method. It has some statistical properties, but it's basically a heuristic search, and you do a lot of prior indexing. So you try to uh, front load the search as much as you can and do a lot of it offline. And then you do some hashing and indexing, and then when you really have a query, you try to, I mean, you just, look at relatively short matches and you extend just those. So instead of going to the entire database, you look at a subset. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's a very popular uh, method. A lot of people are using it. Um, it gives some results. I mean, you can argue, of course, this will be optimal, uh, or full alignment would be optimal, but the runtime of BLAST is, is much faster and it, it makes it a practical solution. Um, so most people just use BLAST. And it's something that people almost use on a daily basis uh, for many different things nowadays. Okay, but this is a heuristic solution. The question was, of course, and that was back in the 90s, whether there is anything else you can do. So um, we got off, instead of doing this specific alignment, which is a long time thing, is there anything else that we can do? And that's where machine learning actually um, came, I would say, uh, or became an option for this uh, for this problem. So the idea was that instead of using a, a dynamic programming or instead of using um, this alignment based methods, let's try to use hidden Markov models. And hidden Markov models require you to think of the problem slightly differently, but it turns out that um, you know, almost by definition hidden Markov models do this when, right, if you take a lot of sequences and you learn an unsupervised learning in the Markov models, you almost by definition get some alignment. Uh, but the hidden Markov model alignment has a different type of interpretation, right? It's probabilistic. And it turns out that you can tailor it very nicely to this specific problem. So let's talk about the hidden Markov model solution. Before we go there, let me introduce another concept. Um, and that is the comp concept of protein families. So in addition to the fact that proteins are similar across species, Proteins are also a, or can be divided into families within each species. And of course, across the species, um, they, they, they remain the same family. So just as an example, uh, one of the largest protein families is something called receptors, uh, which are usually also the drug targets. So, um, you know, we have a cell, but cells don't work on their own. They communicate with other things and with the environment, for example, the drugs that enter to the cells. And on the cell surface, there are a set of proteins that are called receptors, and they basically sit with one, one end outside of the cell and one end inside the cell. So they are the ones transmitting the information from the outside to the inside of the cell. It's possible to actually penetrate the cell, but most cues don't do that. They just interact with the receptors that are sitting there, and these convey the information. Receptors are a large family of proteins. They can be identified because they need this component that allows them to stick inside and outside of the cell. So basically, it's actually easy to look at the sequence and determine which protein is a receptor just based on the sequence. But knowing that your protein that you are working with is a receptor is already very useful information, right? If I have a sequence of a protein I don't know anything about and someone tells me this is a receptor, that's a great uh, information. Even receptors themselves, receptors are a huge family thousands of proteins are receptors, even they can be divided into subgroups and so forth, so we can, so this already gives us, so if we have a database and we have this 100 proteins are immune receptors, 
that's a good information for us as a starting guess for the protein that we are interested in. Other proteins are interacting with the DNA, so they have a specific domain that can do that and so forth. So it's possible to divide proteins pretty, I mean, it requires some biological knowledge, but it is possible to divide proteins into different families, okay? So once we divide them into families, we can start talking about a model for specific families, right? Rather than doing this alignment individually for each protein, you know, maybe we care about more because, I mean, yeah, at some stage we may want to do that, but maybe to narrow it down, we'll just first find the family and that's just align it to the members of the family. But how do we define a family? A family, not in the sense of biology, but in the sense of sequence. So the question was, how do we come up with a model for a family? And it turns out that you can define it pretty well with a hidden Markov model. Okay, and there are other ways to do it. So people have suggested a number of different ways, um, something called multiple alignment. I will show you in a second, but it's not trivial. Um, so we can, by the way, we can take the a pairwise alignment. Let's say I give you three sequences. I give you three sequences and I ask you to align them. Um, I mean, Right? And, and each position is basically the sum of the scores of the three different alignments. So A to B, B to C, and C to A. How long this will take? Can you, I mean, what's the computation complexity of doing this? So instead of two, do three or four or five? What? Two. So basically, right. So you can actually extend uh, dynamic programming into higher dimensions but it's going to be exponential in the number of sequences you are aligning. Uh, what's a possible solution, by the way, for this? If you want to do multiple sequence alignment, I give you 10 sequences and I ask you to align them. One way is to build a model like HMM model, but what's another way of doing this? Simple way that people have played with, which is what I'm writing here. It's not going to solve the problem, it's, uh, right? I mean, the solution is exponential, but a heuristic or something around that, any idea? So, so one way, right, is to take one of the sequences, have it as an anchor, and, and align everything to that sequence, right? So instead of getting all the pairs, we just get one alignment. So, so that's something people actually have used quite a lot. So we take one sequence, we align all the others to it, one by one, and that's the alignment we end up with. So we don't care about but anyway, that's not a very good uh, direction. Uh, another thing is regular expression. Again, I'm not going to go into that. Consensus sequence, so to look at only a subset and forget about insertions and deletions. But what people really, dis or, really or what became really the canonical solution was to use hidden Markov models for this. So how, how can hidden Markov models uh, be used for this? So let's assume initially that we have uh, something called multiple sequence alignment multiple alignment. I, I, I'm not telling you how we get there, we'll get to that, but let's assume initially that someone give, gives us uh, this multiple sequence alignment. We said that it's very hard to do, it's exponential in the size of the sequence, but if someone gives it to us, then we actually have this uh, aligned sequences. And you can see that here I'm aligning six, five different sequences, um, and this is the alignment that will minimize uh, depending on the parameters, but as for a set of parameters, this is the best alignment you can get. So I have some insertions, some deletions, and some substitutions, but overall they are pretty, they are in pretty good agreement. So in order to get an HMM out of this model, here's the formula that we, that we are using. And again, this is very easy because we started with the alignment. In, in general, we are not going to have the alignment. We're just going to have a bunch of proteins that belong to the same family. But let's assume initially that we do have the alignment. So we start with a predetermined number of states accounting for the matches uh, that we have here. So here we have um, one, two, three, five, six match states, and here there is some state that looks like some insertion. Some of them are longer, some of them are shorter, but another insertion. So we start with that. For each position in the model, okay, so for each match state, for example, we assign so for each state in our HMA model, we assign one column, okay? So we have one column matches one state, the second column matches the second state, the third matches the third state, 
this thing will match one state for five, six, and seven. Okay, so we have a state matches for each one of those. We set the initial probabilities according to the distribution in each column. So, for example, here I'm saying 80% probability of emitting A and 20% probability of emitting T. Right, emission probabilities in the Markov model. Similarly here, and so forth. And I'm setting the transition probabilities based on the observation that I have. So, for example, if I'm here, there is some probability of going to the insert state, and there is some probability of jumping to this state. Yeah. And, and this will become clear in a second. Um, by the way, why is it reasonable to assign the emission probability is based on the frequency that we see. Why, why is that? So basically I'm saying the emission probability is 0.8 for A and 0.2 for T. And maybe 0.8 for C and 0.2 for G. Why is this something we should do? Exactly. So you have learned this, right? The maximum likelihood estimator of the polynomial distribution is just counts. You count how many you see, divide by the total number, and this is the maximum likelihood estimator. Similarly for the transition probability. So let me show you how this looks like, and this will make it clearer. So here's the model we get from the, starting from the alignment, which is easy, but just to illustrate the idea. So we set one, two, three, four, five, six match states, one insertion state, and the, transition, the emission probabilities are based on the counts that we see. Um, this is actually pretty dangerous, right? So we assign C and G to zero, whereas A and T, we actually have some value. Of course, we don't like to assign things to zero. So one thing we can do is use pseudo counts or any other tricks that you learn to change the initial probabilities. But other than that, it's fine. Um, in terms of transitions, we always transition from the first, the left column to the second column to the third column. But once we get to the third column, some sequences transition directly to the sixth. You can see, that, for example, the first sequence transitions directly to the sixth, and also the first one, whereas others have this insertion state. So we actually count its 0.6 probability going up and 0.4 going right. And then once you are in the insertion state, right, two of the three sequences go to the sixth column, and one stays there for a while. So we actually compute this probability. So this is the model that we get based on, on, on this alignment. OK, so we have um, a few match states, right? In terms of the HMM, we have seven states in this HMM. We have a transition probability matrix, which is pretty sparse, right? We only allow transitions from, in this case, from some states to other states, but not for everything. And we have an emission probability for each state. But this is basically an HMM. What do we do with this HMM? So why, why did we actually start it with that? We can actually build this HMM for any protein family. Let's say we define 200 different protein families. Each time we get a new data, a new entry in our database, we assign it to a specific family, retrain, but we have the models. But now, instead of working with tens of thousands of proteins, we have 200 or 300 different models. Okay? Now, once we have a query gene, what do we do? We compute the probability of the query gene, or we compute the likelihood of the query gene, given each of our 300 models. How long is this going to take? We have a set of models. We have query gene. Each model is an HMM. So how long would it take us to compute the vacuum? Anybody remembers the HMM? The number of times, the number of edges. The number of types? For one family, forget, I mean, how long will it take me to compute the score for one family, one model? Right, so, uh, right, so basic, or in this case, because we have, usually we only have, uh, right, we are going to have linear number, relatively small number of outgoing uh, edges for each one, maybe two or three, you'll see in a second. So basically it's going to be the number of, or the size of the sequence times the size of the, or the number of states in the model. So basically, because the roughly equivalent, it's going to be quadratic in the size of the sequence. But now, which is exactly what we had before, right? Because 
Why is that, by the way? Why is this code running? <laughs> because we're also doing dynamic programming, right, in the Viterbi algorithm. So HMM is also solved by dynamic programming. But the advantage that we, so we didn't get any advantage, but the advantage that we have is that instead of doing this for tens or hundreds of thousands, we are doing it for 200 or 300 families. So now we have a representation, probabilistic representation, which is very appropriate here, probabilistic representation for our data set or database that is much more compact but contains almost the same information as the original representation. So we can actually save huge amount of time, even though the algorithm is basically very similar compared to the original assumption. Okay, so this works reasonably well if we start with a multiple sequence alignment. But what if we are don't start, which is usually the case. We get just a bunch of sequences. Let's say we get 200 sequences, and they tell us here's the family. How do we get a model based on, out of that? We don't have an alignment. So how do we go about generating an HMA model? So I guess you cover the HMM a bit, but in general, right, in HMM, for, say for speech, right, we get a lot of different speech parts, or a lot of different, uh, and, and some of them maybe we know the emissions, some we don't, uh, the hidden states. But, in many but we actually can generate HMMs for, in this case, right, we don't know what are the states that we have, and we of course don't know the, we don't observe the hidden values of the uh, states. But we can still learn an HMM, right? Even if it's completely unsupervised, right? By the forward-backward algorithm, and I guess you cover that, right? So we can actually learn um, uh, models for HMM from comp starting from completely unsupervised uh, set of strings, for example. And this is done iteratively using an EM algorithm, um, right? Which in the E step computes assignments of more or less of the sequences to the different states, and in the M-step compute the maximum likely estimate, given this assignments or soft assignments, and iterates until we get the model of the region. So we can do the same thing here. So this is what we talked about, that this takes a quadratic time, and you can actually score it. So if you are given to a, right, so this is, if we, give, if we are given two, two different uh, sequences, we can say which one is more likely to belong to this family. Okay, but the next question, as we said, is how do we, um, how do we, uh, com how do we, div oh, how do we get the HMM when we don't have the multiple alignment um, to start with? So what we do is we need to determine initially how many uh, match states we have, or we need to estimate how many match states we have. It's not a huge problem. Usually, it's better to estimate more than less because we can end up with some things that are not used, whereas if we didn't estimate enough, I mean, we won't have where to put the data. So usually we want to estimate more match states than we have. Um, uh, and then we align uh, the sequences. So we start with a model. We align oh, some random model, basically. We align sequences to the model. And then we iterate, and we learn the model parameters, and then we iterate until we converge. Okay? And of course, as a byproduct, this produces a multiple alignment, because for each sequence, when we look at the Viterbi path, we can say, did it go to this state, that state, that state? And based on that, we can say, based on some definition we give to the states, we can say, what is the path that the sequence takes? And based on that, we can actually get a multiple alignment. So using the HMM learning algorithm, we actually can get a multiple alignment. To do that, we need to do something called the profile HMM. And we need to, as I mentioned initially, remember why we expect to see differences between the different sequences. So one difference could be substitutions. How do we deal with substitutions in the HMM model? Yes? Right, so we deal with it using emission probabilities, right? So we allow different emissions from the same state. So you have a substitution, instead of A, you're going to have a T, I'm allowing different emissions. Good. What about insertions? How do we deal with insertions in the HMA model? So you add a new letter that shouldn't be there in the HMA model that I've shown you? Yes? How loops, is loops inside of states? So loops, but beyond that, we are adding a new state for the insertion as well, right? So it's not in the same match state, we are adding a specific state that matches insertions. 
Right. We didn't talk about deletions, but we can handle deletions as well. How would you handle deletions in an HMA model? Okay, so one solution is we have a match state, we have another match state, and we have a deletion, then we jump over that. Any other idea? What if we have three deletions in a row? Then you need the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Okay, how? So, you could say that in, uh, rather than going from this thing, or not going down to this directly, go less. Okay, and then? Right, so you can, and what's the emission for the deletion state? Because in insertion, we add a new state. You want to add the state for deletion? No, I said that um, we could model the original sequence itself with states which are not using here. Uh, right, right. So basically, add a new state for the deletion. You're saying, or no? Because for insertions, right, we didn't put it. We put it above the linear path, and this is a new state. You can stay there, you can go. But now we are talking about deletion. So I'm saying that when you model, you create a multiple family, you don't make it linear, but instead have it with um, additional states that are outside the path. Right, right, right. right. You're making, so even if there is, so if there is no deletion, it follows that loop, or like the additional thing. But if there is a deletion, it just Oh, so you want, uh, but then, okay, but then your model is primarily affected by the deletions because everything below is going to be affected. If you have a deletion, you don't allow things, even though 99% of the sequences have this, because of the deletion, that doesn't seem like a good solution for, uh, it's fine, but any other solutions for the deletion state? Right. Right, so one thing we can do, actually it's pretty easy to do, is to have a state. The emission probability is not going to be anything, but we are still going to have transition probabilities. That's important because we want to penalize the emission. If anything, if anything goes, then nobody will just, everybody will just go there and stay there, right? I mean, but let's say we have this match states here, and here we have a deletion state. You can go to the deletion state. You can even stay there for a while although it's not very beneficial, or you can jump to this one or this one here, but you have to pay a penalty, okay? If you jump to this, it's 0.6. If you jump to this, it's 0.4. So basically, the more deletions you add, the more penalty I'm putting on you for that. So you can use the deletion state, but add a penalty for that. Right, so that's the basic idea. Yes? How many, how many deletion states are there? So one for model, one for state. So you'll see the same, okay? Let me show you. Um, actually, there are a lot of deletion states, but they are different here. So here's the so, so let's start with the match state that we talked about before, and, and, we can, and we all agree, I think, that it makes sense. So we have this. I'm not going to model everything. I'm just going to do, I think, the first. OK. So I skipped this A thing. I don't know why. Anyway, so this is the, the first second, third, and uh, 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 last um, column. You can see that I'm not putting um, uh, probabilities here yet. I am putting the emission probabilities based on the uh, alignment. So um, I'm starting with a set of match states. Of course, I didn't know initially that I'm going to have this, but if we had four match states, this is more or less how it would look like. Now we are allowing insertions. Insertions can be, a, can be a, at any point, right? We can have an insertion after the first one because we don't, of course, when we have the alignment, we know. But initially, when we design the model, we don't know where the insertions can be. So we have to allow insertions, right? When you talk about an HMA model, right, we have to define a few things. We have to define the language. We have to define the set of states. And we usually learn the transition and emission probabilities. But usually, at least in most cases, we define the set of states. So here I'm defining the set of states. I'm not going to say how I'm going to use them, but at least initially I'm defining the set of states. So I have the set of uh, uh, match states, and then I have the set of insertion states, as people here mentioned. I'm allowing a, an insertion in each step, but it could be that I'm putting a transition probability of one here, meaning that I'm not going to use this insertion state. The transition is zero, even though it's in my model, it's never going to be used. Okay? But I'm allowing it. 
In some cases, I'm going to use it as we did before for this. Now, in addition to this, I want to put deletion states. And deletion states look like this. First of all, you can transition from one deletion state to the next, which is something we talked about because you can have multiple deletions at once, but you're going to pay a penalty because the transition probabilities are going to be low, depending on your model, but slightly going to be low. And, but also, you can go from a match state to a delete state and then jump back to the next match state, or go to the delete and jump two states and so forth. So you can insert, one second, so you can insert, so you have three types of states, a match state, an, an, an emission, a, an insert state, and a delete state, and by learning the parameters based on your data, you will get the alignment and you'll get the probabilities. Yes, question? You can go directly from an insertion to a deletion in the model? In this model, you're allowed. I mean, this is, again, this is a design thing. You can decide that you don't allow that or you allow it. It's up to you. I mean, basically. I mean, of course, with all the models, the, the big challenge is how much data you have. If you have a very large family with 500, 1,000, you can have more complicated models. I mean, you talked about overfitting, right, in this class. So the more data you have, the more complex model. In, in theory, it could be that you'll go from an insert to a delete state. I mean, it could happen. Whether or not you want to allow it is based on how much data you have to basically learn it. But in practice, it could happen. OK, so this is a specific type of, uh, of, of hidden Markov models called profile hidden Markov models. And um, they actually have been uh, pretty popular. Um, a number of people have uh, uh, developed them, including Hausler, David Hausler, who is one of the leading computational biology people but also was one of the leading machine learning people before that. Um, and, and they are widely used to describe, basically all protein families are now modeled using this type of models. And when you have a new protein, you can just align it to these. So first of all, it gives you an idea. It, it gives you a lot of other information. It gives you an idea what are the important proteins, what are the match states, what are the important characteristics of this family. But also when you have a new query, you can just look at the model. And if you have a few hundred models, just align it to the model and get the results uh, from this model. But by the way, what's the drawback of this method? Uh, for, for, for protein families, what, what could be a problem with this? Uh, what's the drawback of using hidden Markov models for modeling protein families? Anybody can think of a problem with that? It's actually a general problem, I would say, with the but clearly a problem here for protein. I mean, think of how proteins look, maybe. What is the assumption we make in HMM that makes them very powerful but also restricted? Okay, so why is that a problem? Uh, it's not necessarily just strictly sequential. Right. So that's usually the main problem with this uh, model for working with proteins. Um, hidden Markov models are based on the Markov assumption. The Markov assumption is that you're independent of anything um, before, before you, as long as you, con you condition on your immediately previous state. Right? If I know the previous state, I'm independent of anything that happens before me. Okay? But that's not true when you talk about three-dimensional structures. Okay, in three-dimensional structures, things can be very far away in the linear chain, but still touch each other in the three-dimensional case. And why is that important? Because it could be that, you know, we are talking about the probability of insertion given that I'm here. But it could be that the insertion is a function of, of this point here and another completely different point here. They, they interact, and it's much, so if there is insertion here, it's much more likely to have an insertion there and so forth. So this linear model is definitely problematic for three-dimensional structure, but it works reasonably well. There are, t there are other models that people have been trying to use. Um, a lot of people are using other types of uh, uh, graphical models, uh, including undirected graphical models, uh, Markov random fields to model these, the relationship between residues and now take into account, right, if you have Markov random fields, you can connect things that are linearly in the chain, but also things that are not necessarily linear in the chain. Because you can have more than one edge coming out from each node. You can have more, more, many more than that. And then use that information as well, but that's a separate issue. Okay, so this is a, 
This is the idea of using HMMs, and as I said, very popular uh, method. Um, right, so in, uh, some other problems we have is that, uh, right, um, HMMs are uh, only are giving you, depending on the starting, but of course we can't, because we are using an EM algorithm, we are not guaranteed to get an optimal solution. Uh, we are just getting an optimally local solution depending on, or, uh, depending on the starting point of the HMM. If we do a lot of restarts, depending on how many data we have, uh, we can improve the solution, but not necessarily get the optimal solution. Um, okay, so that's basically it. Um, so just to summarize this direction, so, uh, so the idea of sequence analysis and sequence queries is something that people in computational biology have cared about for a long time. Initially, this was based on a very specific combinatorial algorithms, which work very well, but require a lot of times. People moved to heuristics methods um, when the size of the database grew, but it turned out that a computational solution based on machine learning and specifically on hidden Markov models is probably the best uh, um, uh, compromise, I would say, between the specificity that you get from the right alignment and the time advantage that you get from the heuristic. So it's not a heuristic, but we still are not optimal like the original alignment, but it's a very powerful method. Okay, so that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about, H about this specific ex uh, problem or computational biology in general. Yes. So um, I think one of the challenges might be uh, understanding the functional impact of variations. Definitely. Yeah. And so um, you see a uh, kind of additive error that because you make a proper mistake about the sequence alignments, that this error accumulates through the protein alignment to something that you make. So, Usually when people, right, so all of these queries are usually just the first step. You never conclude anything from this. It's just a way to point you to some direction. So let's say you get some, uh, let's say you get some family as, a, as an outcome, right? Usually people don't necessarily believe it directly. So now you can do, for example, a more experiment. elaborate alignment. Well, experiments too, but once you have this, you can actually do much more elaborate, find the best match within the family, for example, see what are the differences, and then. So it's a good way to narrow down your, prob your search, but it's never the end result of these type of, uh, but it's a very important way of narrowing down the possibilities. Anything else? Okay, thank you.